Science and technology. Waste disposal. Moth eaten. Could caterpillars save the planet from plastic waste? Most scientific research follows a logical progression, with one experiment following on the findings of another. Every now and then, however, serendipity plays a part. Such is the case with a paper just published in Current Biology, which reveals to the world a moth capable of chewing up plastic. The experiment behind the paper was inspired when Federica Bottichini, an amateur beekeeper who is also a biologist at Cantabria University in Spain, noticed caterpillars chewing holes through the wax in some of her hives and lapping up the honey. To identify them, she took some home in a plastic shopping bag. But when a few hours later she got around to looking at her captives, she found the bag was full of holes and the caterpillars were roaming around her house. After rounding them up, she identified them as larvae of the greater wax moth, a well-known pest of beehives. On considering their escape from their shopping bag prison, though, she wondered whether they might somehow be put to work as garbage disposal agents. Past attempts to use living organisms to get rid of plastics have not gone well. Even the most promising species, a bacterium called Nocardia asteroides, takes more than six months to obliterate a film of plastic a mere half millimetre thick. Judging by the job they had done on her bag, Dr. Bertacchini suspected wax moth caterpillars would perform much better than that. To test this idea, she teamed up with Paolo Bombelli and Christopher Howe, two biochemists at Cambridge University. Dr. Bombelli and Dr. Howe pointed out that, like beeswax, many plastics are held together by methylene bridges, structures that consist of one carbon and two hydrogen atoms, with the carbon also linked to two other atoms. Few organisms have enzymes that can break such bridges, which is why these plastics are not normally biodegradable. The team suspected wax moths had cracked the problem. One of the most persistent constituents of rubbish dumps is polyethylene, which is composed entirely of methylene bridges linked to one another. So it was on polyethylene that the trio concentrated. When they put wax moth caterpillars onto the sort of film it had taken Nocardia asteroides half a year to deal with, they found that holes appeared in it within 40 minutes. On closer examination, Dr. Bertacchini and her colleagues discovered that their caterpillars each ate an average of 2.2 holes, 3 millimetres across, every hour in the plastic film. A follow-up test found that a caterpillar took about 12 hours to consume a milligram of shopping bag. Such bags weigh about 3 grams, so 100 larvae might, if they spent half their lives eating, consume one in a month. Whether releasing wax moths on the world's surplus plastic really is sensible is not yet clear. For one thing, it has not been established whether the caterpillars gain nutritional value from the plastics they eat, as well as being able to digest them. If they do not, their lives as garbage disposal operatives are likely to be short, and even if they do, they will need other nutrients to thrive and grow. Another question is the composition of their faeces. If these turn out to be toxic, then there will be little point in pursuing the matter. Regardless of this, though, the discovery that wax moth larvae can eat plastic is intriguing. Even if the moths themselves are not the answer to the problem of plastic waste, some other animal out there might be. Science and Technology An artificial womb the ultimate grow bag. To save children born prematurely, a man-made uterus would help. These days, in rich countries, premature birth is the main cause of infant mortality. A baby born at 23 weeks, just over halfway through a normal pregnancy, has a fighting chance of survival. But underdeveloped lungs struggle to cope with breathing air, External pumps used to circulate blood impose potentially fatal stresses on tiny hearts. Those that do pull through are often left with lifelong problems that range from brain damage to blindness. In a paper just published in Nature Communications, 
a team of doctors at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, led by Alan Flake, describe an artificial womb that, they hope, could improve things dramatically, boosting the survival rate of the most premature babies while reducing the chance of lasting disabilities. The device, which looks a bit like a high-tech jiffy bag, is designed to mimic a real womb as closely as possible. The fetus, a lamb in the team's trials, is surrounded in a substitute for the amniotic fluid that keeps the animal's lungs filled with liquid in a real uterus. Once the fetus is placed inside the bag, it is sealed to prevent germs entering. The cannulas, which carry blood away to be recharged with oxygen and nutrients, are inserted into the animal's umbilical cord, and the tubing in the oxygen exchange system is short, which lets the researchers dispense with pumps entirely. Instead, they rely on the animal's own heart to push blood around the system. The results are impressive. The artificial womb kept premature lambs alive for four weeks, which is longer than any previous attempt. The researchers say they could have carried on for longer still had their trial protocols not forbidden it. The lambs developed normally, growing wool and moving around as they would in a natural womb. When Dr. Flake's team subsequently dissected them, they found no evidence of the strokes that sometimes afflict premature babies in conventional incubators. The aim is to produce a system that could help human babies born at 23 weeks, which is currently the lower limit of viability. Between a third and half of such babies survive, and even that requires heroic efforts. It will be a while, though, before the technology arrives in hospitals. For one thing, the parallels between sheep and people are not perfect. Human fetuses at a similar stage of gestation are only about a third of the size of lambs, so the equipment will have to be shrunk commensurately. And any procedure applied to such delicate patients will require a lot of proving before regulators give the go-ahead. Treating mothers at risk of premature birth with steroids, for instance, helps prepare their baby's lungs for breathing air and is now routine. But it took more than 20 years of tests and research before that discovery was deemed robust enough to make its way into hospitals. Books and Arts the Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017, in the Books and Arts section. Heretics and Believers, Reformation in England. Fiction from Denmark, High Anxiety. Johnson, on Machine Translation, and more. Books and Arts Book Review The Reformation in England Fanning the Flames The English were surprisingly divided about the Tudor's break with the Pope in Rome and the introduction of the Reformation. Just a day after the English Book of Common Prayer was first used in Samford Courtney, Devon, on Whit Sunday in 1549, an angry mob appeared at the church door. They demanded that the elderly rector reconsider using the new liturgy. Somewhat sheepishly, one imagines, he decided to don his popish vestments and revert to saying the Latin Mass. That village protest was the first of a series of English uprisings in Norfolk, Oxfordshire and the southwest, which led to perhaps 10,000 deaths as King Edward VI regime suppressed dissent. It would be a mistake to think that the English Reformation was mostly peaceful, with beheadings and burnings confined to a small and fervent elite. The historiography of Tudor England usually focuses on the monarch's Reformation, how the state imposed religious change on the nation. Shelves groan with royal histories, but new accounts of how the ordinary English felt, objected to, and imbibed it all are much more scarce. 
On the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's Reformation, Peter Marshall has written a fine history of a momentous time, a scene from the bottom up, drawing on a wide range of primary sources and his evident scholarship. Mr. Marshall has two contentions. First, that the English did not meekly comply with religious change. In the cities they were enthused by it, but many others resisted, especially in the rural and conservative north and west of the country. Second, that though royal supremacy was the aim, the state ultimately lost control as Christian pluralism flowered. In places, the king's majesty was questioned, as some began to think afresh about monarchy and church government. England ended with a less united religion than it had at the start of the 16th century. The central story will be familiar. Henry VIII wanted to cut financial and legal ties to the Catholic Church in order to achieve national sovereignty and marry whom he liked. He was keen to shut down monasteries, rivals to kingly power for nearly 1,000 years, but he was never a zealous advocate of radical new ideas about the meaning of the communion service, for example. Henry's attempts to please opposing court factions left England with a vague, incoherent set of tenets for a church without a pope, thinks Mr. Marshall. Confusion about the national religion led more people to define and investigate their faith for themselves. Under Henry's children, Edward VI and Mary, state zealotry fueled outrage and enthusiasm. Edward's ministers set out to destroy idolatry in church, including saints' paintings, church silver, inappropriate altars and glitzy vestments. Mary returned sovereignty to Rome and launched a campaign of burning heretics. In St. Paul's Cathedral hung a rood, a grand figure of Christ on the cross, the centre of the medieval churchgoer's attention and piety, which provided a political bellwether through these years. The rood was ordered to come down under Edward. It crashed to the floor, killing two labourers beneath, perhaps not a great omen. The route was ordered up again in Mary's reign. A man rose from his pew to deliver a mocking encomium to your mastership, the ascendant rood. It soon came down again under Elizabeth I. What became known as the Elizabethan Settlement, a return to Protestantism, far from settled the matter. The Queen's bishops wanted to go further than Edward VI. Some in England wished to ban bishops altogether, looking to John Calvin in Geneva for inspiration. Elizabeth's bishops despaired of her liking for icons and vestments, but defended her nonetheless. Mr. Marshall provides convincing evidence that Catholicism survived well into Elizabeth's reign. At least 800 clergymen were deprived or removed themselves for reasons of conscience, including as many as a quarter of the clergy in one diocese, Rochester, that is not far from Canterbury. Only 21 out of 90 senior clergy in northern England assented to the settlement, and 36 openly disagreed. Dissent among middle-ranking clergy was even higher. Of those not removed by the 1559 flu epidemic, fewer than half wished to continue. A rebellion, reckoned to be 7,000 strong, in favour of the Pope in 1569, was brutally suppressed. Many followers of the old religion simply conformed and dissembled. It is hard to understand how the people coped through these years. Tombs were vandalized, vicars protested at funerals, one village curate was known to shave his Protestant beard every time a change in religion was rumored. However the English survived the Reformation, they did so as a nation divided. Whig histories typically focus on the progress that the state and evangelicals made in forging a Church of England, a history of the winners. Mr. Marshall's contribution is a riveting account of the losers as well, the English zealots and cynics who wanted a better world or an unchanging one. The resulting story is of a Henrician supremacy that failed and an Elizabethan unity that never was. Books and Arts Book Review Britain and the European Union
Brexit blues. There are many theories about why Britons voted last June to leave the European Union. They include hostility to immigration, dislike of Brussels bureaucrats, worries about sovereignty, an anti-elite mood, the discontent of those left behind by globalization, a long history of Euro scepticism, and a stridently anti-EU press. Yet analysis of hard survey data is rare. The great virtue of Brexit, why Britain voted to leave the European Union by three academics, is that it is based on detailed regression analyses of panel surveys carried out both before and after the vote. Using data as opposed to hunches yields interesting results, even if many confirm conventional wisdom. One concerns who mostly voted for Brexit. The answer is old people, non-graduates, and those from lower social grades. Although members of the UK Independence Party or UKIP, founded to take Britain out, tend to be male, there was no gender bias. Nor were Brexit voters necessarily poor. Many were in the home counties and south, as well as the less well-off north and east. A second is the importance of immigration. When David Cameron promised a referendum in his speech at Bloomberg in January 2013, he made no reference to this. Even many Tories who, unlike Mr. Cameron, campaigned for Brexit, stressed regaining sovereignty, not reducing the numbers coming into the country. But the authors put more credence on the goal of Nigel Farage, UKIP's then leader. To make people see migration and Europe as the same. Indeed, a third conclusion is the central role of UKIP and Mr. Farage. It was the rise of UKIP more than his own restive backbenchers that drove Mr. Cameron to offer the referendum, and far from causing damage, splits within the Leave campaign may even have helped. Mr. Farage could appeal to those once dismissed by Mr. Cameron as fruitcakes, loonies, and closet racists, while Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, two leading Tory Brexiteers, could win over the more globally minded. Yet Brexit did not prevail just because Leavers outfought Remainers. More important were what this book calls baked-in views, built up over years of criticism of the EU. When Mr. Cameron came back from Brussels in February 2016 to campaign to remain, his credibility was weakened by his previous attacks. Even armed with dire warnings of the costs of Brexit, so-called Project Fear, it proved impossible to persuade voters. Partly because many who believed Project Fear consciously decided to give priority to curbing migration. Remainers never tried to make a serious case in favour of immigration. More controversially, the authors argue that there may turn out not to be large costs from Brexit. They note that for most countries, including Britain, EU membership has not had much impact. Accession to the club has more often than not been followed by slower growth. Yet this is not convincing. Nobody knows what would have happened had the country not joined. And most economists, including those at the impartial Bank of England, reckon that membership has made Britain more competitive, raising growth. What may be true is that other policy choices matter more than being in the world's largest trading bloc. That notion chimes with the different economic performance of EU countries. Broadly, Germany and the Scandinavians have done well. Whereas France and the Mediterranean countries have not, on this basis, a post-Brexit Britain could prosper, as long as it follows good pro-growth policies. As an ill-tempered election in June draws near, however, that proviso is worrying. Books and arts. Book review. Cheryl Sandberg on grief. To have and to hold. Option B: facing adversity, building resilience, and finding joy. By Cheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant.
In 2013, Sheryl Sandberg became famous thanks to Lean In, her book about how women can control their own fate if they lean in to opportunities. But in 2015, the senior Facebook executive was reminded that you can lean in and still fail to control the direction of your life. While on holiday in Mexico, her husband, Dave Goldberg, suffered from a heart arrhythmia, fell off a treadmill and died. Ms. Sandberg shares a great deal of herself and what she has learned since in Option B, which she has written with Adam Grant, a professor of psychology and management at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and author of Originals, a business book about out-of-the-box thinking. Option B takes its name from an anecdote in which Ms. Sandberg tells a friend that she does not want to take part in a parent-child activity without Goldberg. With option A not available, she has to choose the second best option. At its core, option B is a self-help book for those who have been felled by despair. People who have not experienced tragedy often distance themselves from mourners, uncertain of what to say or how to act. But what mourners want is for others to recognise their pain, not hide from it. This book is a guide both for those who have directly suffered loss and for those who are close to people who have. Its optimistic thesis is that adversity can change people for the better. They can bounce forward after a tragedy and become more resilient. Ms. Sandberg tracks how her behaviour and perceptions of life changed when she lost her husband. She acknowledges that she was too simplistic in her earlier book, telling women looking to excel professionally that they should share household chores with their husbands. Many women are single mothers who raise children alone, without a partner. Ms. Sandberg realised this when she found herself suddenly on her own, albeit with vastly more resources than most. The most provocative chapter is about widowhood and dating after losing a spouse. Women are judged harshly for finding another partner. Among the middle-aged, more than half of men are in a romantic relationship a year after losing their spouse, compared with only 7% of women. Ms. Sandberg experienced at first hand the guilt and stigma that accompany contemplating moving forward, although she was fortunate to have support from Goldberg's mother and brother. The author is admirably and chillingly honest in the details she shares about the aftermath of Goldberg's death. She describes the primal screams of her children when she tells them their father is dead, and how her mother slept in her bed for a month, holding her as she cried each night. Recounting these stories takes courage, especially for a businesswoman who always appears highly scripted in her public statements. Option B will be helpful for many mourners. But two things hold it back. Although the book has two authors, Ms. Sandberg narrates in the first person and Mr. Grant is referred to in the third. It feels unbalanced. Indeed, Mr. Grant does not really appear until about a quarter of the way through the book, and the reader may be left wondering whose voice is really telling this story. Corporate self-promotion also sneaks into the book's pages where it does not belong, with mentions of Facebook's power to connect grievers and make the world better. In the end, an online social network can never really lift someone's fog of grief. It needs time, strength and a willingness to believe that against the odds, something good can one day emerge from the bad. Books and Arts Book Review Fiction from Denmark High Anxiety Mirror, Shoulder, Signal By Daughter Noors Translated by Misha Hoekstra Sonia, the heroine of Mirror, Shoulder, Signal, is single and perplexed, and has reached the age when everything that's supposed to get easier in life persists in being complicated. Daughter Nors wraps bittersweet recollections of Sonia's girlhood on a farm in Jutland and her lonely, oddball youth around her driving lessons through the Copenhagen suburbs. Shortlisted for this year's Man Booker International Prize, this sly, deadpan Danish novel steers its mischievous comedy of character and manners over a viscid underworld of sorrow.
Always the outsider, Sonia revokes her smugly well-adjusted sister, Kate, once a barn dance femme fatale, and now also a caring supermum. Ellen, a massage therapist, and a psychologist chum called Molly. All are overconfident interpreters of a reality that Sonia was never able to explain. There are also glimpses of a vanished lover, Paul, the ex. If the present baffles, the past consoles. Sonia sees memories in visions of swans in flight, of rustling rye fields in Jutland, and in the vast, eerie, and capricious wilderness of Lunburg Heath. Sonia thinks that she resembles her mother, both gifted with rich, expansive inner worlds, but as women, not completely fine-tuned. With its endearingly maverick heroine, Ms. Noor's novel delivers a bracing antidote to the cult of Hygge, which has smothered Denmark's global image under a hand-knitted jumper of sentimental bonhomie. Misha Hoekstra, the translator, smartly matches Sonia's erratic course, gawky one moment, graceful the next. Ms. Noor's, meanwhile, deals a vicious blow to another Nordic stereotype, Sonia earns her living translating a Swedish crime writer, Josta Svensson, an idolized star of noir who tends in his books to leave mutilated women and children rotting everywhere on Scandinavian public land. His latest chart topper has wowed the critics as a harrowing read about human trafficking. Ms. Noor's, in contrast, turns her gridlocked human traffic into a transport of delight. Books and Arts The Museum of the American Revolution A Hymn to the Republic A new museum re-examines the birth of America For people who pride themselves on keeping their eyes on the future, Americans often seem mired in their own history. Here, the past is never safely buried, but is continually exhumed to shape and reshape the present. Political battles are waged through contested narratives that have been centuries in the making. The new Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, which is only two streets from Independence Hall, the nation's birthplace, will help shape people's understanding of the founding struggle for many years to come. David McCullough, a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and long-time champion of the project, believes it will serve as an exemplar for an age sorely in need of a moral compass. He hopes that learning more about those who were engaged in the desperate struggle for liberty, in particular the example of George Washington, will inspire current and future generations. Character, it's what counts most of all. That is what's taught in the story of the revolution, he says. The museum tries hard to break down the barriers that separate the 18th century from today. Its handsome new classical brick-clad building engages in friendly dialogue with the historical buildings around it. Inside, the conversation between old and new is amped up a couple of decibels. On one side, a revolutionary era artifacts, including weapons of war like a musket commissioned by Washington from a Philadelphia gunsmith, as well as everyday objects and political texts, including a page from the Pennsylvania Evening Post of July 6, 1776, with the first published text of the Declaration of Independence. Fleshing out these stories, a tableau with life-size mannequins that recreate telling moments, the toppling of a statue of King George in New York, a meeting of the leaders of the Oneida Indian nation as they debate whether to join the colonists' struggle. The story of the nation's founding springs to life in an atmosphere that more closely resembles a theme park than a traditional archive. In one gallery, visitors are thrown into the heart of the action through a multimedia restaging of the Battle of Brandywine, complete with fog machine and ground-shaking effects. One thing is clear, this is not your grandfather's museum, either in the story it tells or in the way it tells it. 
Scott Stevenson, head of collections, exhibitions and programming, says he does not want to present history as a pious sermon, but as a richer, messier tale. This messier tale exposes the hypocrisy of people who fought in the name of liberty while denying it to others. The stirring rhetoric of the Declaration of Independence can ring a bit hollow as visitors contemplate shackles small enough to bind the limbs of the youngest slaves. Still, there is plenty that is uplifting on display as well, stories of heroic sacrifice, including harrowing tales of the bitter winter at Valley Forge, or of scrappy Minutemen facing off against hardened veterans at Lexington and Concord. The museum celebrates high ideals that were not always lived up to in practice, but that paved the way for future advances in human rights. The way that history and its symbols are so often the subject of a struggle is captured here by the saga of the museum's star attraction, Washington's Headquarters Tent, which served as the General's mobile home throughout most of the war. Passed down through the family of Washington's widow, the tent came into the possession of Mary Custis Lee, the wife of Robert E. Lee, who commanded the army that attempted, in the 1860s, to tear apart the nation that Washington had worked so hard to stitch together. When General Lee's Virginia home was overrun by Union soldiers, the tent was brought back to the capital and put on display to serve as a patriotic rallying point. Forty years later, it was returned to the family and later sold to raise money to support the widows of Confederate veterans. Now, Treated as a sacred relic, Washington's wartime headquarters forms the centerpiece of a new museum dedicated to the continuing American argument over the meaning of its past. Books and Arts Johnson Word for Word Translation platforms such as Google Translate cannot replace humans, but they are still astonishingly useful. Arab newspapers have a reputation, partly deserved, for tamely taking the official line. On any given day, for example, you might read that a source close to the Iranian foreign ministry told al Hayat that Tehran will continue to abide by the terms of the nuclear agreement as long as the other side does the same. But the exceptional thing about this unexceptional story is that thanks to Google, English-speaking readers can now read this in the Arab papers themselves. In the past few months, free online translators have suddenly got much better. This may come as a surprise to those who've tried to make use of them in the past, but in November, Google unveiled a new version of Translate. The old version, called Phrase-Based Machine Translation, worked on hunks of a sentence separately, with an output that was usually choppy and often inaccurate. The new system still makes mistakes, but these are now relatively rare, where once they were ubiquitous. It uses an artificial neural network, linking digital neurons in several layers, each one feeding its output to the next layer in an approach that is loosely modelled on the human brain. Neural translation systems, like the phrase-based systems before them, are first trained by huge volumes of text translated by humans. But the neural version takes each word and uses the surrounding context to turn it into a kind of abstract digital representation. It then tries to find the closest matching representation in the target language based on what it has learned before. Neural translation handles long sentences much better than previous versions did. The new Google Translate began by translating eight languages to and from English, most of them European. It is much easier for machines and humans to translate between closely related languages. But Google has also extended its neural engine to languages like Chinese, included in the first batch, and more recently to Arabic, Hebrew, Russian and Vietnamese, an exciting leap forward for these languages that are both important and difficult. On April 25th, 
Google extended neural translation to nine Indian languages. Microsoft also has a neural system for several hard languages. Google Translate does still occasionally garble sentences. The introduction to a Haaret story in Hebrew had text that Google translated as, according to the results of the truth, in the first round of the presidential elections, Macron and Le Pen went to the second round on May 7. In third place are François Payon of the right and Jean-Luc of Lanchon on the far left. If you don't know what this is about, it is nigh on useless. But if you know that it is about the French election, you can see that the engine has badly translated samples of the official results as results of the truth. It has also given odd transliterations for Emmanuel Macron and François Fillon. P and F can be the same letter in Hebrew. And it has done something particularly funny with Jean-Luc Mélenchon's surname. A word beginning M-E can mean of in Hebrew. The system is dumb, having no way of knowing that Mr. Mélenchon is a French politician. It has merely been trained on lots of text previously translated from Hebrew to English. Such fairly predictable errors should gradually be winnowed out as the programmers improve the system. But some mistakes from neural translation systems can seem mysterious. Users have found that typing in random characters in languages such as Thai, for example, results in Google producing oddly surreal translations like There are six sparks in the sky, each with six spheres. The sphere of the sphere is the sphere of the sphere. Although this might put a few postmodern poets out of work, neural translation systems aren't ready to replace humans any time soon. Literature requires far too supple an understanding of the author's intentions and culture for machines to do the job. And for critical work, technical, financial or legal, say, Small mistakes, of which even the best systems still produce plenty, are unacceptable. A human will, at the very least, have to be at the wheel to vet and edit the output of automatic systems. Online translating is of great benefit to the globally curious. Many people long to see what other cultures are reading and talking about, but have no time to learn the languages. Though still finding its feet, the new generation of translation software dangles the promise of being able to do just that. Obituary Emma Morano Ancient as the Hills Emma Morano, the oldest recorded Italian, and for a year, the oldest person in the world, died on April 15th, aged 117. Those who live to be very old are never previously famous. Few in the world know them, and they know almost nothing of the world. Emma Morano had never been to Rome, let alone abroad. Her world was Palazzo Verbania, on the shores of Lake Maggiore in northern Italy, stretching to Varallo Sessia in the hills, where she had family. The fading photographs she would lay out on a lace cloth for reporters showed herself and her siblings enjoying lunch outside, posing in Palanza's main square and on the lakeside promenade, all within a stroll of the tiny flat down an alley by the church of San Leonardo, where she still lived. For her last fifteen years, though she could walk, she did not leave it. The very old tend not to have led glamorous lives. They work deep in the fabric of the everyday. Miss Morano's job, from the age of 13 to 55, was in Maione's jute factory, sewing sacks for potatoes. After that, she worked for 20 years as a dinner lady at a local college. The young Emma wondered sometimes, since she had a lovely voice, a voice that would stop men in their tracks when she sang Parlami d'amore, Mario, from the window, about a musical career. But the thought wasn't serious, and she contented herself with listening to Claudio Villa's popular songs on the radio, a device first dreamed up in the year she was born. Visitors often marvelled at the events she had lived through, not least the tumultuous history of Italy from monarchy 
through fascism to republic, but much of the time her head had been down, sewing sacks. She remembered Victor Emmanuel III and the Queen too, but the second decade of the twentieth century was vivid mostly for slipping out of the house to go dancing and for birch stick beatings on her legs when her mother caught her. The first war was memorable only because her fidanzato, Augusto, was called up and did not return. When his letters stopped, she assumed he was dead, and never learned, because no one told her, that he had left town for a steelworks in Milan. Similarly, the rise of fascism was overshadowed by growing violence in her own house. She recalled the constant black shirt parades, but far worse was the abuse from Giovanni, the man she had married in 1926, after he had threatened to kill her otherwise. She dreaded marrying him, but could not escape. He was from the lake, too, living in the same courtyard, and both sets of parents pressed her. In 1937, she had a little son. He lived from January till August. The next year, she kicked Giovanni out, and they separated. Divorce was not yet legal, and separation itself was rare. This made her a pioneer, she felt. When researchers called, puzzling over her longevity, she told them that a single life definitely helped. She refused to let anyone dominate her, including the manager of the jute factory, who completely lost his head over her and proposed running away together. That in the days when lowly female workers did not dare answer back to superiors. And her determination played a part, too. It showed in the large baby photograph she kept in the kitchen, bold, dark eyes, a fierce little chin, her amulet askew on her neck. It was just as evident in middle age, when she prided herself on working hard to pay for things she wanted, like her hand-carved bedroom suite, and at a hundred and twelve, when she still manoeuvred heavy copper pans on the stove and put down newspaper to save her floors from muddy feet. The family genes were good, with several members living to advanced old age, but as a girl she was often ill. The doctor diagnosed anemia and advised a move to the lake shore, from which she did not move again. He also told her to eat three eggs a day, two of them raw, a diet she kept to for almost a century, usually scooping them up with biscotti from a bowl. For lunch she had pasta with raw minced meat, for supper, a glass of milk. At night, she would raid the biscotti and the large tin of jandiotti, local hazelnut chocolates, that sat on the sideboard. Last came her home-spiked grappa, infused in a wide-necked jar with seven sage leaves, herbs and a few grapes, and taken in spoonfuls every day. This diet, doctors said, broke all the rules. Its only virtues were simplicity and long, long regularity. Those same virtues applied to her life as a whole. It had three pillars, family, self-sufficiency and faith. Her flat was a shrine to them all. Glass bead rosaries were draped over framed photographs of her parents, brothers and sisters, and the Holy Family presided above her bed. The Madonna and Child watched over her bedside table, where she kept the anti-aging cream she faithfully smoothed on each night. She liked to watch Mass on Channel 4, since it was shorter than the Rai one. She had not lost her impish streak. As for death, Cond Lavenia Lavenia, and her prized collection of chiming clocks ticked her way towards it. On May 12, 2016, Fame and glamour arrived together as she became the world's oldest person. Officials rained certificates on her. The gas company thanked her for her loyalty and the mayor for her services to tourism. On her 117th birthday, a huge cake came and a team from Rye. At the party in her flat, she sang Parlami d'amore, Mario, again, though she was cross that her voice had gone. My word, she told a neighbour, I'm as old as the hills, the hills she had never been beyond. 
Economist. April 29th to May 5th, 2017. Word for word. The articles from this week's edition of The Economist, including... From the Leaders section, End of Life Care, How to Have a Better Death. From the Business section, The Office of Tomorrow, Sofas and Surveillance. From the Americas section, Canada and the United States, Food Fight and more. The World This Week, Politics. Emmanuel Macron topped the first round of the presidential election in France and will meet Marine Le Pen in a runoff on May 7th. Markets were buoyed by Mr Macron's performance. Opinion polls put the former economy minister well ahead of his nationalist rival. A few days before the vote, a policeman was killed by an Islamist on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Turkey broadened its purge of people in public positions who the government claims belong to the movement allegedly behind last year's failed coup. Some 1,000 people, mostly police officers, were arrested and another 2,200 were being sought. Another 9,000 police were suspended from duty. A court in South Africa knocked back the government's plan to spend as much as one trillion rand, that's $76 billion, building nuclear power stations with help from Russia, in a deal that critics say the country cannot afford. The courts ruled that an agreement signed with Russia was unconstitutional, as it was not approved by Parliament. America started to withdraw its soldiers from the Central African Republic, where they had been assisting in the fight against the Lord's Resistance Army, a rebel group notorious for using child soldiers that was formed in Uganda but later fled across the border. The leader of the main opposition party in Zambia, Hakainde Hichilema, appeared in court. Mr Hichilema, who has been repeatedly arrested by the government since narrowly losing an election in August 2016, was charged with treason after his motorcade failed to halt as it was being passed by one containing Zambia's president, Edgar Lungu. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu snubbed Germany's foreign minister, refusing to meet him during a trip to Jerusalem because he had visited two human rights groups that Mr Netanyahu views as hostile. Iran's Guardian Council ruled that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a former president, is ineligible to run in this year's presidential election. More deaths during protests in Venezuela meant that at least 29 people have died in nearly a month of demonstrations for and against the country's authoritarian regime. They began after the Supreme Court usurped the powers of the legislature, which is controlled by the opposition, and continued even though the court changed its mind. Opposition politicians blamed some of the deaths on paramilitary groups. Venezuela said it will withdraw from the Organization of American States, which has criticized its regime for crushing democracy. A gang of about 50 men raided a security firm in the Paraguayan city of Ciudad del Este. After killing a police officer, they reportedly made off with millions of dollars. Some crossed the reservoir at the Itaipu Hydroelectric Dam to Brazil, where three robbers were killed in a shootout. America levied duties averaging 20% on imports of softwood lumber from Canada. America claims that Canada subsidises the lumber by charging too little to firms that harvest the trees, which are mostly grown on public land. Donald Trump called Canada's protection for its dairy farmers a disgrace, but he also said that America would not pull out of NAFTA and would instead seek to renegotiate the free trade agreement. Donald Trump laid out a wide-ranging tax reform plan, the centrepiece of which is slashing corporation tax from 35% to 15%. Months of negotiations lie ahead with Congress, especially over the effect on future budget deficits. The threat of a government shutdown seems to be averted when Mr Trump backed away from insisting that funding for the wall he wants to build along the Mexican border should be included in a spending bill that will keep the government running until September 30th. Arkansas began executing the eight prisoners it wants to put to death before a batch of a drug used in lethal injections reaches its expiry date. Two inmates were executed on the same evening. 
an 18-year-old youth in Israel with American and Israeli citizenship, was charged with making hoax bomb threats to Jewish centers in America. The threat sparked a furore earlier this year, which many people blamed on Mr. Trump's supporters among the alt-right. Taliban insurgents killed 140 soldiers in an assault on an Afghan army base. It was the deadliest attack on a military facility in Afghanistan since the toppling of the Taliban government in 2001. India ordered telecoms firms to block the use of social networks in the state of Kashmir, which has been paralysed by violent protests that the security services have been attempting to quell by force. America began installing THAAD, an anti-missile system, in South Korea. Despite local protests and objections from China, Yamin Rashid, an outspoken blogger in the Maldives, was murdered. He had been leading a campaign to locate an abducted journalist who had written about the nexus between politics, criminals, and Islamic extremism. A Chinese court sentenced an American woman to three and a half years in prison for spying. Sandy Fan Gillis was detained in 2015 during a business trip. As she has already spent time in detention, she could be released early. China launched its first domestically made aircraft carrier. The ship will undergo extensive tests before being put into service. Meanwhile, China's first cargo spacecraft docked successfully with an orbiting space lab. It aims to build a manned space station by 2022. Britain's political parties hit the trail in the first week of election campaigning. The governing Conservative Party capitalised on its position on Brexit. Labour's leader Jeremy Corbyn claimed his party could win, but rather than his fairy tale, the polls tell a sorry tale for Labour, showing it lagging far behind the Tories. The UK Independence Party has also slumped. UKIP's leader said he will not put up candidates in some seats where a pro-Brexit candidate can oust a pro-Remain one. The world this week, business. Credit Suisse announced plans to sell four billion Swiss francs, that's four billion dollars worth of new shares, two years after it raised six billion Swiss francs in a similar share issue. The Swiss bank reported a better than expected profit for the first quarter, a boost for management. Last year, Credit Suisse made a substantial loss, prompting a shareholder revolt over the pay of its chief executive and chairman. Irate shareholders disrupted the annual meeting at Wells Fargo, peppering board members with questions about what they knew and when about a scandal in which fake accounts were created by staff under pressure to beat targets. All the bank's directors were re-elected at the meeting, but the chairman, Stephen Sanger, received only 56% support. He promised that the clear message of dissatisfaction had got through. The British government at last recovered all the money it spent bailing out Lloyd's Banking Group during the financial crisis, mostly by selling tranches of the shares it had bought, but also because of hefty dividends it received after Lloyd's return to financial health. The bank doubled its pre-tax profit in the first quarter to 1.3 billion pounds. That's 1.6 billion dollars, and lifted its outlook for the year. The European Commission confirmed that Greece recorded a primary budget surplus, which excludes debt repayments, of 4.2 percent of GDP last year. That was the country's first such surplus in 21 years. But the IMF reckons Greece is not out of the woods yet. SNCF, the French state-owned rail company, joined a consortium that includes Stagecoach and Virgin Trains to bid for the contracts to operate trains on the proposed High Speed Two link that will run between London and the north of England. SNCF will have a 30% stake in the joint venture. United Airlines published a report into the case of a passenger who was violently removed from a plane because he refused to give up his seat after being bumped. United said it will reduce overbookings on certain flights, increase the amount for voluntarily giving up a seat to ten thousand dollars, and give staff more training in how to calm tense situations. 
The Nasdaq stock market index closed above the 6,000 mark for the first time. It breached 5,000 during the dot-com boom in 2000. After that bubble burst, it didn't hit 5,000 again until March 2015. The biggest companies on the Nasdaq in 2000 were Microsoft, Cisco and Intel. Today, they are Apple, Google and Microsoft. The tech-heavy index has outperformed the S&P 500 so far this year. A post-election rally in the share prices of banks and industrial companies has wavered and investors are instead piling into high-growth tech firms. Facing up to criticisms that it is not doing enough to tackle the problem, Google decided to change the algorithm on its search engine in order to give less prominence to fake news and other low-quality content. Google and social media sites such as Facebook were lambasted last year for hosting hoax news articles during the US election. Lafarge Holsim said that Eric Olson would resign as chief executive following an independent internal report into the cement maker's decision to keep a factory operating in Syria during the early years of the civil war. The report's summary acknowledged that Lafarge had paid off armed groups to keep workers safe and the plant open. But the firm, says Mr Olson, was not responsible for the scandal. PPG, an American chemical company, again raised its takeover offer for Axo Nobel, a Dutch maker of paints which owns the Dulux brand. Axo has repeatedly spurned PPG's approaches to the chagrin of some investors. This week it roundly rejected a call by an activist hedge fund to hold a meeting of shareholders to discuss sacking the chairman. Bernard Arnault simplified his holdings in LVMH and Christian Dior by unveiling a complex transaction to buy out investors in the latter. The deal is worth around 12 billion euros, that's 13 billion dollars. The luxury goods business has picked up recently, but rather than make new purchases, Mr Arno wants to consolidate his LVMH empire. Famous for its stilettos and a favourite of Princess Diana, Jimmy Choo put itself up for sale following a run of bad results. The shoemaker is 70% owned by JAB Holding, an investment firm that is focusing its business on building a coffee retail empire. For the first time in 130 years, Britain's electricity network generated power over a full day without having to use coal. The linchpin of the Industrial Revolution, coal now fuels only around 10% of Britain's electricity generation as coal-fired power stations are gradually phased out. Leaders The Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017. In the Leaders section. End-of-life care. How to have a better death. Donald Trump's tax plan, under audit. The Arctic, polar bear, and more. As a listener to The Economist's audio edition, you're familiar with our unrivaled insight into politics, business, science, technology, and the arts. In today's changing world, the one thing that's certain is uncertainty. Make sense of it all with clear thinking on global affairs from The Economist. Digital subscribers receive access to the entire audio edition each week, along with Economist.com and our apps, including Espresso, our daily morning briefing. Print Plus digital subscribers also receive the weekly edition delivered to their door. If you are not yet a subscriber, visit economist.com slash new world for our introductory offer. The Economist. Clear thinking in an uncertain world. Leaders. How to have a better death. Death is inevitable. A bad death is not. In 1662, a London haberdasher with an eye for numbers published the first quantitative account of death. John Graunt tallied causes such as the king's evil, a tubercular disease believed to be cured by the monarch's touch. Others seem uncanny, even poetic. In 1632, 15 Londoners made away themselves, 11 died of grief, 
and the pair fell to lethargy. Grant's book is a glimpse of the suddenness and terror of death before modern medicine. It came early too. Until the twentieth century, the average human lived about as long as a chimpanzee. Today, science and economic growth mean that no land mammal lives longer. Yet, an unintended consequence has been to turn dying into a medical experience. How, when, and where death happens has changed over the past century. As late as 1990, half of deaths worldwide were caused by chronic diseases. In 2015, the share was two-thirds. Most deaths in rich countries follow years of uneven deterioration. Roughly two-thirds happen in a hospital or nursing home. They often come after a crescendo of desperate treatment. Nearly a third of Americans who die after 65 will have spent time in an intensive care unit in their final three months of life. Almost a fifth undergo surgery in their last month. Such zealous intervention can be agonizing for all concerned. Cancer patients who die in hospital typically experience more pain, stress, and depression than similar patients who die in a hospice or at home. Their families are more likely to argue with doctors and each other, to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and to feel prolonged grief. Most important, these medicalized deaths do not seem to be what people want. Polls, including one carried out in four large countries by the Kaiser Family Foundation, an American think tank, and The Economist, find that most people in good health hope that when the time comes, they will die at home. And few, when asked about their hopes for their final days, say that their priority is to live as long as possible. Rather, they want to die free from pain, at peace, and surrounded by loved ones for whom they are not a burden. Some deaths are unavoidably miserable. Not everyone will be in a condition to toast death's imminence with champagne, as Anton Chekhov did. What people say they will want while they are well may change as the end nears. One reason why doctors are skeptical about the instructions set out in living wills: dying at home is less appealing if all the medical kit is at the hospital. A treatment that is unbearable in the imagination can seem like the lesser of two evils when the alternative is death. Some patients will want to fight until all hope is lost. But too often, patients receive drastic treatment in spite of their dying wishes. By default, when doctors do everything possible as they have been trained to, without talking through people's preferences or ensuring that the prognosis is clearly understood. Just a third of American patients with terminal cancer are asked about their goals at the end of life. For example, whether they wish to attend a special event such as a grandchild's wedding. Even if that means leaving hospital and risking an earlier death, in many other countries the share is even lower. Most oncologists who see a lot of dying patients say they have never been taught how to talk to them. This newspaper has called for the legalization of doctor-assisted dying, so that mentally fit, terminally ill patients can be helped to end their lives if that is their wish. But the right to die is just one part of better care at the end of life. The evidence suggests that most people want this option, but that few would, in the end, choose to exercise it. To give people the death they say they want, medicine should take some simple steps. More palliative care is needed. This neglected branch of medicine deals with the relief of pain and other symptoms, such as breathlessness, as well as counselling for the terminally ill. Until recently, it was often dismissed as barely medicine at all, mere tea and sympathy when all hope was gone. Even in Britain, where the hospice movement began, access to palliative care is patchy. Recent studies have shown how wrong-headed that is. Providing it earlier in the course of advanced cancer, alongside the usual treatments, turns out not only to reduce suffering but to prolong life too. Most doctors enter medicine to help people delay death, not to talk about its inevitability. But talk they must. A good start would be the wider use of the Serious Illness Conversation Guide, drawn up by Atul Gawande, a surgeon and author. 
It is a short questionnaire designed to find out what terminally ill patients know about their condition and to understand what their goals are as the end nears. Early research suggests it encourages more earlier conversations and reduces suffering. These changes should be part of a broad shift in the way healthcare systems deal with serious illness. Much care for the chronically ill needs to move out of hospitals altogether. That would mean some healthcare funding being diverted to social support. The financial incentives for doctors and hospitals need to change too. They are typically paid by insurers and governments to do things to patients, not to try to prevent disease or to make patients comfortable. Medicare, America's public health scheme for the over 65s, has recently started paying doctors for in-depth conversations with terminally ill patients. Other national healthcare systems and insurers should follow. Cost is not an obstacle since informed, engaged patients will be less likely to want pointless procedures. Fewer doctors may be sued, as poor communication is a common theme in malpractice claims. Most people feel dread when they contemplate their mortality, as death has been hidden away in hospitals and nursing homes. It has become less familiar and harder to talk about. Politicians are scared to bring up end-of-life care in case they are accused of setting up death panels. But honest and open conversations with the dying should be as much a part of modern medicine as prescribing drugs or fixing broken bones. A better death means a better life, right until the end. Leaders, Donald Trump's tax plan under audit. The Trump administration's tax plan. Does not match its laudable rhetoric. America's tax system is a disaster. It is a self-defeating combination of fairly high tax rates and generous exemptions that mean little money is actually raised. It is mind-bogglingly complex. The income tax code is so knotty that America has as many tax preparers per one thousand people as Indonesia has doctors. It distorts behavior. American firms have at least one trillion dollars worth of cash stashed abroad to avoid the taxman. Change is hard, but not impossible. In 1986, Ronald Reagan and lawmakers from both parties proved that, with sufficient patience, persistence, and willingness to compromise, it can happen. Their bill slashed tax rates while broadening the tax base so much that no revenue was lost. In fact, the money raised from corporations rose after Reagan signed the bill. This newspaper would cheer heartily if the set of principles unveiled by the Trump administration on April twenty-sixth marked the first steps towards meaningful tax reform. The White House is making many of the right noises. It promises simplification by, say, reducing seven personal income tax brackets to three, and getting rid of some of the deductions that distort behaviour and add complexity. It pledges tax relief for middle-income earners by doubling the income tax threshold. It plans to replace America's extraterritorial approach, whereby foreign profits are subject to American taxes when they are repatriated, with a more sensible territorial one. Much of this is welcome. Alas, Mr. Trump's tax plan is just an opening gambit. There are many reasons to doubt that America will end up with a Reaganite outcome. To see why, consider corporate tax first. The Trump team wants to cut the corporate tax rate to 15 percent from 35 percent today, but its claim to pay for the cuts with a sustained rise in economic growth is fanciful. The plan does not include the lucrative border adjustment provision sought by House Republicans. Instead, in addition to the promise of faster growth, it relies on a one-off tax on repatriated foreign profits. And the abolition of deductions. The trouble is that some gaping loopholes have already been protected, 
and others are likely to open up. Take, for example, Mr. Trump's desire to extend the 15% rate to individuals who run small firms. This would cause high earners to masquerade as firms in order to benefit from a lower rate. The administration thinks it can stop this, but history suggests otherwise. A failure to keep taxes for individuals and small firms the same was one of the mistakes of the 1986 tax reform. It contributed to the number of S corporations growing by almost 500 percent between 1980 and 2002. More recently, Kansas tried something a bit like Mr. Trump's proposal at a state level. It led to a surge in avoidance. Despite the doubling of the income tax threshold, the proposed changes to personal tax contain a lot that is regressive. This week's outline includes big giveaways that benefit only the rich. The top rate of income tax would fall from 39.6 percent to 35 percent. The alternative minimum tax, which makes avoidance harder, would be scrapped. So too the estate tax, a change benefiting only those leaving more than 5.5 million dollars to their heirs. As just the opening round in a negotiation, this week's announcement could yet lead to something decent. To achieve sensible, long-lasting reform, Mr. Trump needs the support of some Democrats in the Senate. In a best case, that would lead the administration to think harder about how to make the plan revenue neutral and to spread the benefits of lower taxes to the middle class. The danger is that it leads somewhere else entirely. A tax cut that principally benefits the rich and that is paid for with more borrowing. Leaders. The nuclear deal with Iran. Wave hello. America has weeks to decide whether to ditch or uphold the agreement on Iran's nuclear program. Time is running out for Donald Trump to make up his mind about the Iran nuclear deal of 2015. Before May 17th, President Trump must decide whether to continue Barack Obama's suspension of nuclear-related sanctions, Iran's reward for constraining its nuclear program. If Mr. Trump does not issue a waiver, sanctions will snap back. The other signatories to the deal will see America as the aggressor, unless Iran goes on to violate the deal flagrantly. They will not follow suit. The chances are that Iran would then slowly crank its program up again. That would be a terrible outcome. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, as the deal is known, has got Iran to mothball most of its uranium enrichment centrifuges and redesign its nuclear reactor at Arak to produce much less plutonium. Before the JCPOA, Iran was just a few months away from being able to make an atom bomb. That has been pushed back to a few years. Mr. Trump's words suggest that he thinks the agreement is already dead. What Mr. Obama saw as his greatest foreign policy achievement, his successor has branded one of the worst deals I've ever seen. However, the reality is more ambiguous. Rex Tillerson, America's Secretary of State, sent a letter to Congress on April 18th, declaring that Iran had complied with the terms of the nuclear deal. A judgment confirmed by James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, on a visit to Israel, Iran's implacable enemy. Iranian compliance is good news, but strangely, the State Department website buried it under the headline "Iran continues to sponsor terrorism." Next, calling the deal flawed, Mr. Tillerson said that the National Security Council would undertake a 90-day review to decide whether to maintain the suspension of the sanctions. And Mr. Trump himself said that Iran had broken the spirit of the agreement. Asked whether America would still honor it, he said, "It's possible that we won't." Mr. Tillerson complains that the deal only delays Iran from becoming a nuclear power, and that its regional aggression is unrestrained. He is right. Yet the deal intentionally separated the nuclear program from regional security because lumping the two together would have created stalemate. 
Some valuable provisions of the agreement, such as highly intrusive monitoring of Iran's nuclear activities by international weapons inspectors, are permanent. Besides, the alternative is war. Critics are also right to say that the idea that Iran might moderate with time is optimistic. But it is no less optimistic than tearing the deal up in the hope of somehow getting something better. Mr. Trump may reckon that by sounding tough, he will win tweaks to the deal that he can claim as revolutionary. But that is a dangerous game. The Iranian presidential election comes two days after the waiver deadline on May 17th. If Mr. Trump demurs, the chances of a hard-line candidate winning will be greatly improved. Republicans in Congress are also spoiling to impose new sanctions on Iran. If the hardliners on both sides triumph, the deal's fate will be sealed. Refusing to issue the waiver would also undermine America's foreign policy goals in Asia. Mr. Tillerson compared the Iran deal to past failures to curb North Korea's nuclear program. In fact, the JCPOA reflects the lessons learned from those failures by building in extremely detailed requirements. If America hastily rips up the Iranian deal when Iran is compliant, it would destroy any chance of one with North Korea. Mr. Trump can issue the waiver pending completion of the review of the nuclear deal. If that helps him find a way back from his campaign rhetoric, it will have served a purpose. Leaders The Arctic Polar Bear the Arctic, as it is known today, is almost certainly gone. Those who doubt the power of human beings to change Earth's climate should look to the Arctic and shiver. There is no need to pore over records of temperatures and atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. The process is starkly visible in the shrinkage of the ice that covers the Arctic Ocean. In the past 30 years, the minimum coverage of summer ice has fallen by half. Its volume has fallen by three quarters. On current trends, the Arctic Ocean will be largely ice-free in summer by 2040. Climate change skeptics will shrug. Some may even celebrate. An ice-free Arctic Ocean promises a shortcut for shipping between the Pacific coast of Asia and the Atlantic coasts of Europe and the Americas and the possibility of prospecting for perhaps a fifth of the planet's undiscovered supplies of oil and natural gas. Such reactions are profoundly misguided. Never mind that the low price of oil and gas means searching for them in the Arctic is no longer worthwhile, or that the much-vaunted sea passages are likely to carry only a trickle of trade. The right response is fear. The Arctic is not merely a bellwether of matters climatic, but an actor in them. The current period of global warming that Earth is undergoing is caused by certain gases in the atmosphere, notably carbon dioxide. These admit heat in the form of sunlight, but block its radiation back into space in the form of longer wavelength infrared. That traps heat in the air, the water, and the land. More carbon dioxide equals more warming, a simple equation. Except it is not simple. A number of feedback loops complicate matters. Some dampen warming down, some speed it up. Two in the Arctic may speed it up quite a lot. One is that seawater is much darker than ice, it absorbs heat rather than reflecting it back into space. That melts more ice, which leaves more seawater exposed, which melts more ice, and so on. This helps explain why the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet. The deal on climate change made in Paris in 2015 is meant to stop Earth's surface temperature rising by more than 2 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels. In the unlikely event that it is fully implemented, winter temperatures over the Arctic Ocean will still warm by between 5 and 9 degrees Celsius compared with their 1986 to 2005 average. The second feedback loop 
concerns not the water but the land. In the Arctic, much of this is permafrost. That frozen soil locks up a lot of organic material. If the permafrost melts, its organic contents can escape as a result of fire or decay in the form of carbon dioxide or methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. This will speed up global warming directly, and the soot from the fires, when it settles on the ice, will darken it and thus speed its melting still more. A warming Arctic could have malevolent effects. The world's winds are driven in large part by the temperature difference between the poles and the tropics. If the Arctic heats faster than the tropics, this difference will decrease and wind speeds will slow, as they have done in the northern hemisphere by between five and fifteen percent in the past thirty years. Less wind might sound desirable; it is not. One consequence is erratic behavior of the northern jet stream, a circumpolar current, the oscillations of which sometimes bring cold air south and warm air north. More exaggerated oscillations would spell blizzards and heat waves in unexpected places at unexpected times. Ocean currents too may slow. The melting of Arctic ice dilutes salt water moving north from the tropics. That makes it less dense and thus less inclined to sink for the return journey in the ocean depths. This slowing of circulation will tug at currents around the world, with effects on everything from the Indian monsoon to the pattern of El Nino in the Pacific Ocean. The scariest possibility of all is that something happens to the ice cap covering Greenland. This contains about ten percent of the world's fresh water. If bits of it melted or just broke free to float in the water, sea levels could rise by a lot more than today's projection of seventy-four centimeters by the end of the century. At the moment, the risk of this happening is hard to assess because data are difficult to gather. But loss of ice from Greenland is accelerating. What to do about all this is a different question. Even if the Paris Agreement is stuck to scrupulously the amount of carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere, together with that which will be added, looks bound eventually to make summer Arctic sea ice a thing of the past. Some talk of geoengineering, for example, spraying sulfates into the polar air to reflect sunlight back into space, or using salt to seed the creation of sunlight-blocking clouds. Such ideas would have unknown side effects, but they are worth testing in pilot studies. The hard truth, however, is that the Arctic, as it is known today, is almost certainly gone. Efforts to mitigate global warming by cutting emissions remain essential, but the state of the Arctic shows that humans cannot simply undo climate change; they will have to adapt to it. Leaders, central banks, the wars of independence. How best to preserve the benefits of central bank autonomy? On May sixth, nineteen ninety-seven, Gordon Brown, freshly installed as Britain's Chancellor of the Exchequer, announced that he was giving the Bank of England the responsibility for setting interest rates. The bank would be charged with meeting an inflation target set by the government. The move was hailed as a political masterstroke. It gave substance to the new Labour government's claims to economic competence. Long-term borrowing costs fell sharply. The pounds soared. The bank's governor, Eddie George, was delighted, but joy was not unconfined. Within weeks, Mr. Brown, weary of an overmighty central bank, stripped it of its responsibilities for bank regulation and public debt management. Twenty years on, some fear that central banks have become too powerful. The Bank of England is back in charge of bank regulation. The European Central Bank, or ECB, has added that job in the eurozone to a host of others it has picked up since the financial crisis.
The Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 gave America's Federal Reserve authority to ensure financial stability. Central banks have acquired more tools to go with their extra tasks, but they have also come in for louder criticism. The Bank of England was bashed for its assessment of Brexit. The ECB's quantitative easing, or QE, programme has been challenged in Germany's courts. A bill in Congress calls for the Fed's decisions to be audited. Savers moan about low interest rates. The case for central bank independence is as powerful as it was two decades ago. Interest rates need to be changed well before they will affect inflation. Politicians are loath to be preemptive. An independent central bank is more likely to act promptly to head off inflation, and this trustworthiness also affords it freedom to cut interest rates when recession looms. Yet the critics should not be ignored. The history of central banks shows that their power can ebb and flow. Two of America's central banks folded before the Fed was established. Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon were not averse to bullying Fed chairmen into keeping interest rates low. In addition, the financial crisis of 2008 forced central banks to make controversial decisions, in part because many governments were unable or unwilling to act themselves. They rightly put their resources at risk to bail out banks and keep credit markets working. To counter the bust that followed, took a long period of near zero interest rates and schemes such as QE. But the uneven effects on individuals of this newer sort of monetary policy were stark. One of the more reliable effects of QE was to raise share prices, favouring the well-off. Low rates are a salve to the indebted, but hit deposit holders. Trade-offs of this kind are not new. The task of choosing how many jobs to sacrifice in order to hit an inflation target sooner rather than later is highly political. Yet there are ways in which central bank powers might be circumscribed without hurting the bit of their autonomy that matters. One is to follow the British model, in which the government sets an inflation target for the central bank to follow. Society's preferences over the right rate of inflation are not settled. It may sometimes be necessary to change the target. When low real interest rates are required, for example, it may make sense to aim higher on inflation. That is a decision for elected politicians. Ideally, this target should be symmetrical, meaning that inflation below the target is as undesirable as that above it. Otherwise, rate setters who favour lower inflation have licence to indulge their preferences. Preserving the legitimacy of independent central banks also relies on the actions of central bankers themselves. It is not possible to make the setting of interest rates perfectly neutral or to free central banking from all residue of politics. But wise central bankers would limit their public comments to their own bailiwick. It is fine to point out that a looser fiscal stance would imply higher interest rates, but it is not obvious what is gained when a central banker directly criticises or endorses a specific tax plan or spending policy. Straying onto broader policy issues, as Mark Carney of the Bank of England has on climate change and Raghavan Rajan of the Reserve Bank of India did about religious tolerance, is likely to irk politicians and squander influence better saved for the bank's main tasks. The benefits of central bank autonomy far outweigh the costs, just as they did in 1997. The friction between politicians and bankers cannot simply be wished away. To keep the critics at bay, central bankers must be accountable for the powers delegated to them, and disciplined in their exercise. Letters. Letters on British diplomacy, Brazil, cybercrime, India, and parking. The Diplomatic Front. From Simon Fraser, Permanent Under Secretary from 2010 to 2015, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, London. Badgett is correct. Britain needs a reinvigorated foreign policy led by a stronger foreign office. Article April 15th. 
The world is full of new uncertainties, not least Brexit and the election of President Donald Trump. The British are conflicted about what they want. For many, the Brexit vote was about reducing our exposure to the world. If Britain expects a place at international top tables, we will need to be clear what we bring to the party. That will not be achieved with Potemkin diplomacy. Fortunately, Britain still spends a lot on international action, but only a fraction of it on diplomacy, less than on pensioners' winter fuel allowance. Of every one thousand pounds of public spending, over thirty-three pounds goes on defence, twelve pounds on foreign aid, and two pounds on the Foreign Office. Seven government departments now handle aspects of international policy. That includes the departments for aid, trade, defence, finance, interior or migration, and leaving the EU. To avoid fragmentation, the Foreign Office should coordinate international policy, as the Treasury does domestic economic policy. On Badgett's question about who is the best person to lead this, I plead the fifth. Brazil's Academy Awards. From Edmar Basha, Rio de Janeiro, your account of the closeness of my election to the Brazilian Academy of Letters as reflecting a dispute between the culture wing and a supposed public servants' clutch in the academy was inaccurate. Article Bard of Belindia, April fifteenth. The vote is secret, but in my own calculations, out of the eighteen votes I received. Nine were from the strictly literary members, and nine were from other culture representatives, such as journalists and historians. The vote was tight because my opponent Eros Grau had already been a candidate to the Academy on another occasion when he obtained ten votes. Everyone expected him to surpass that mark this time. The only question was if he would reach the seventeen votes needed to win. Fortunately for me, that didn't happen. Guarding the cyber gates. From Tony Gidwani, Director of Research Operations, Threat Connect, Arlington, Virginia. There is an additional problem to the ones you mentioned in overcoming barriers to make computers more secure. Article: The Myth of Cyber Security, April eighth. When companies such as Apple suffer a hack, like the iCloud leak in twenty fourteen. They will investigate why the attack was successful and how similar incidents might be prevented, but they are not inclined to share their findings with rivals such as Google or Microsoft. So even if one company works out how to defend itself against a particular threat, its peers and their customers remain at risk. The industry's giants are fighting their own fires, but not helping others to extinguish theirs. Our digital culture is also a problem, as it sees cyber security as an individual pursuit, much like building a wall around your property. To make any headway, we need to start viewing the enemies of our enemy as our friends. Barack Obama signed an order in 2015 promoting information sharing and analysis centers to encourage intra-industry collaboration. That's a good start. But the private sector must take a less gladiatorial approach and routinely share security information with peers, including competitors. Death on the roads. From Rajesh Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Public Health, Manipal University, Manipal, India. Regarding drunk driving in India, Article Bar Wars, April eighth. I live in a student town, and accidents from drunk driving are common. Yet I have never seen a breathalyzer in my life, nor have I heard anyone say that they have had to take a test. The Community Against Drunken Driving estimates that seventy percent of all road deaths in India are caused by drunk drivers, with the figure running between forty-four percent and sixty-seven percent in smaller cities. The Supreme Court would not have to take its decision to ban alcohol near highways if the legislature had put enough police on the ground to catch the offenders.
With sales of more than 2.5 million cars and 15 million bikes every year, state governments will do their best to circumvent the court ruling. Indians have a reputation for policy dugard. That figure of 400 traffic deaths a day looks set to go up. They paved paradise. From Jose Viegas, Secretary General, International Transport Forum, Paris. Managing parking space for vehicles is important, but it is ultimately only treating the symptom of car congestion. Article: Sacred Spaces, April 8th. Cars are used in a doubly inefficient way. They run for only 50 minutes in every 24 hours and carry just over a single passenger on average. If capacity could be doubled and the number of cars reduced accordingly, parking would no longer be an issue. The answer is ride sharing. We ran simulations based on data from Lisbon, in which buses and cars were replaced by different types of shared vehicles. The results were striking. A very similar level of service was provided with less than five percent of the current car fleet. The need for street parking disappeared. We are running the same simulation for other cities, among them Auckland, Dublin, and Helsinki. Self-driving vehicles, by contrast, are not in themselves the solution. They are likely to increase car use because those who can't drive now will. They also reduce the incentives for sharing. So, although parking space should become less of a problem with self-driving vehicles, city streets themselves might come to resemble parking lots. From Todd Colby, Orlando, Florida, I would be more likely to join a carpool or take public transport if I knew that my fellow co-workers and I were going into and out of the office at the same time. The erosion of the traditional eight-hour workday is one reason why people don't share rides. We don't know exactly when we'll be heading home at the end of the day. From Kenneth Grundy, High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire. Apocalypse Now, Article April Eighth, overlooked the importance of parking to employment and job creation. The private car lubricates the job market. In southeast England, outside London, anyone with a car has access to a huge job market with a radius of about forty miles. Without it, he has access only to his home town and trains to London. To work its magic, the car needs to be able to park, and the parking must be affordable. From Jurgen Pape, Granville, Ohio. Praying to Saint Anthony may work for some when trying to find parking. Others ensure a slot by filling spaces with fake fire hydrants that they conveniently keep in their cars. Briefing. The Economist, April twenty ninth to May fifth, two thousand and seventeen. In the briefing section. The Arctic skating on thin ice and sea levels and storms. A thaw point. Briefing. The Arctic skating on thin ice. Efforts to limit global warming will not stop the Arctic melting. Due to the global warming, please keep the snow hotel door closed. Reads a sign at the entrance to what appears to be a giant white mound near Kirkenes, close to Norway's Arctic border with Russia. The owners want to preserve the frozen freezes of unicorns, reindeer, and butterflies that adorn its walls. Patches of translucence in the ceilings of the hotel's twenty-five icy rooms suggest the warmth outside is winning. Artificial snow helps build a structure anew each November, and it usually disappears before May. The season has shortened in recent years, says one employee. The cold comes later than before. The snow hotel's lengthening off season is a small sign of an immense transformation in the Arctic, where the environment is changing more rapidly than in the rest of the world. Little can be done to keep its white wastes intact. 
A great thaw is inevitable as the climate responds to an accumulation of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. International efforts to limit global warming will, at best, slow the changes, perhaps making the consequences merely terrible rather than catastrophic. The Paris Agreement will not save the Arctic as it is today, says Lars Otto Rearson, executive secretary of the group behind the latest edition of Snow, Water, Ice, Permafrost in the Arctic, or Swiper. A report produced under the auspices of the Arctic Council, a scientific policy club for the eight countries with territory in the Arctic Circle, as well as observers including China and India, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide has now reached 400 parts per million, or ppm, up from 280 ppm three centuries ago. The Earth is, on average, one degree Celsius hotter. Than in pre-industrial times, although 190 odd countries signed up to limit warming to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures in Paris in 2015, pledges for mitigating action are likely to see temperatures increase by around three degrees Celsius, assuming countries stick to their promises. But different parts of the world warm at different rates. Even if the Paris Agreement is implemented in full, the Arctic will warm by between five degrees Celsius and nine degrees Celsius above the 1986 to 2005 average over the Arctic Ocean in winter. The thaw is happening far faster than once expected. Over the past three decades, the area of sea ice in the Arctic has fallen by more than half. And its volume has plummeted by three quarters. Swiper estimates that the Arctic will be free of sea ice in the summer by 2040. Scientists previously suggested this would not occur until 2070. The thickness of ice in the Central Arctic Ocean declined by 65 percent between 1975 and 2012. Record lows in the maximum extent of Arctic sea ice occurred in March. The most worrying changes are happening in Greenland, which lost an average of 375 billion tons of ice per year between 2011 and 2014, almost twice the rate at which it disappeared between 2003 and 2008. This is the equivalent of over 400 massive icebergs measuring one kilometer on each side disappearing each year. The shrinkage is all the more perturbing because its dynamics are not well understood. Working out what is going on in, around, and underneath a supposedly frigid ice sheet is crucial to understanding how it will respond to further warming and the implications of its demise for rising global sea levels. The Arctic has been warming at twice the rate of the rest of the world for decades because of feedback loops that have reduced the albedo effect, a measure of the way Earth reflects heat. Unlike the rest of the planet, the polar regions release more heat into space than they absorb, in effect cooling the planet because sunlight is reflected by ice and snow. When it is replaced by water or dark ground, more heat is retained. That is precisely what is happening in the Arctic's defrosting landscape. At sea, much Arctic ice once lingered throughout one year and into the next. In 1985, about 45 percent of ice was older and thus thicker. But by 2016, that amount had fallen by half. Huge expanses of ice now melt and refreeze over the year. Older ice tends to be jagged. When it melts, pools form between tough ridges, allowing some heat to reflect. Newly formed ice lets meltwater spread more evenly across its glassy surface. This reduces reflectivity still further. As the land in the Arctic warms and once permanently frozen ground unfreezes, greenhouse gases are released. The dead plants and animals in Arctic permafrost hold about half the world's carbon stored in soil. As this organic matter thaws, it decays, releasing carbon dioxide and methane, another powerful greenhouse gas, and insulating the planet still further. Unfrozen tundra is also tinder for fires. 
Shorter, snowy periods mean fire seasons will lengthen. In Alaska and parts of America's west, the average length of the fire season has already jumped from 50 days in the 1970s to 125 now. Changes in the environment are affecting the numbers and types of creatures that can live there too. Arctic waters are increasingly full of life. The edge of the ice shelf is a feast for many species due to ice algae and phytoplankton that appear there at the end of winter. But decreasing ice may lead to mismatches between the timing of reproductive cycles in creatures such as shrimp and the availability of plankton. As water warms, larvae hatch earlier. Any impact on the populations of tiny crustaceans will affect other creatures higher up the food chain: cod, seals, and polar bears, which need fat sources in their diet. At the same time, new mouths are coming to feed. Zooplankton from southerly waters have moved north at a rate of 200 kilometers a decade as the ocean has warmed. Bigger fish have followed their dinner northward. This sounds like welcome news for hardy fishermen, but it is unclear whether the Arctic can sustain the new arrivals. They will compete with and perhaps eat specialized species dependent on the ice shelf's edge for food. Some experts also argue that fresh water from melting ice in the Barents Sea will curb the growth of the nutrients its inhabitants need. It's all extremely uncertain and depends on ocean circulation patterns, says Michaela Askin, a fisheries professor from the University of Tromsø. Amid all this bad news about the state of the Arctic, the business opportunities associated with warming were supposed to cheer at least a few. The Arctic is an ocean covered in ice, ringed by land, whereas the Antarctic is a lump of land covered in ice, ringed by ocean. The eight Arctic countries have interests in shipping, fishing, and drilling in the region, but finding profits amid the thaw is tough. Prospects look bleaker in many industries than they did five years ago, as the risks are better understood. The Arctic contains more than a fifth of the world's untapped hydrocarbon resources, but in the North American Arctic, offshore drilling was banned in December almost everywhere to protect ecosystems. Although Donald Trump may reverse the moratorium, elsewhere, low prices and the difficulties of operating in the Arctic's dangerous waters now repel big firms attracted to the region back when oil fetched over one hundred dollars a barrel. In a stunning about turn, Shell ended operations in the Chukchi Sea in 2015 after spending seven billion dollars on exploration there. It says it did not find enough oil to justify continuing. Russian firms such as Rosneft are proving hardier. They have fewer opportunities to invest elsewhere, after all, and Russia needs the money. Low oil prices have taken a toll on an economy which relies on the Arctic for a fifth of GDP and a fifth of exports. The shipping industry is another for which Arctic promise has drifted away. In theory, shipping firms should benefit from access to a more open seaway. Using it to sail from northern Europe to northeast Asia can cut the length of voyages by two fifths compared with travelling via the Suez Canal. But an expected shipping boom has not materialized. In 2012, only one million tons of goods were shipped through the Northern Passage, a paltry level of activity, yet one not achieved since. Even in the summer months, the Arctic Ocean is stormy, making timely delivery of goods impossible to guarantee. Drifting ice also poses a danger. Ships must be strengthened to withstand it, adding to construction costs. And a lack of coastal infrastructure, such as deep water ports, means that spills of the heavy fuel oil that powers most vessels could wreak havoc on both ecosystems and reputations, because cleanup missions would have to set out from much farther away and would take much longer to be effective. A new polar code from the International Maritime Organization, which regulates shipping, came into force at the beginning of the year to try to address some of these concerns. 
It bans sewage discharges in polar waters and ones of oily mixtures. America and Canada, among others, want to go further. For one thing, they want to ban on heavy fuel oil, as there is in the Antarctic, which has various special protections. Mining firms interested in metals such as copper are eyeing up the Arctic, but most firms do not have the experience to negotiate with indigenous groups over projects on their land. About one in ten people in the region is from such a group, and many of the inhabitants oppose development anyway. In Norway, the Sami Parliament, which represents Sami people from across the country, is wary. John Peter Gintel, who deals with international affairs at the Parliament, says blighting the landscape would be foolish. Tourists keen to see rugged natural beauty may sustain the Arctic economy in future decades, as traditional livelihoods such as reindeer herding prove harder to maintain. Even if outsiders' commercial interest in the Arctic is cooling. The region's population of around four million people has little choice but to adapt to the changing climate. Northern Norway is the most densely populated area, but Russia, which accounts for half of the Arctic coastline and has a fleet of nuclear submarines based at Murmansk, is the country keenest to extend its influence. Russia eventually wants ten new search and rescue stations along its shoreline. Five are open already. Russia is also aiming to boost its military presence by reopening Soviet military bases. Despite tensions over Russian belligerence elsewhere in the world, its aspirations in the north have so far given little cause for concern. Locals in Kirkenes laugh about their neighbors. They come across here all the time to shop. They like the nappies. They say they are better quality. Explains one businessman. Oysten Bur, Norway's defence minister, is more guarded. Russia is as interested as we are at keeping the Arctic a region of stability, he says. But if Russia decides to wield its power more forcefully, this will only add to the problems in the Arctic. Nothing, however, looms larger than the potential for environmental calamity. The question of thawing is rising up the list of priorities, both of countries with territory in the region and those farther afield. Sticking to the Paris Agreement could eventually stabilize temperatures, but more radical measures may be needed, given that countries are unlikely to keep within the limits set in Paris. One possibility for cooling the pole is geoengineering, the deliberate modification of the climate to reduce warming. Pumping sulfate aerosols into the Arctic stratosphere from high-flying aircraft could be one way to blot out a bit of the sun. Such an approach would cool Arctic summers, but have little effect in winter because there would be no sunlight to reflect. Injecting salt crystals into clouds over the Arctic Ocean to enhance their reflectivity might also encourage some cooling, though the helpfulness of this type of intervention is highly speculative. Either way, the gap between theory and practice is enormous and ethically fraught. Even if such ways to cool the planet could be managed on the vast scale necessary, other unwelcome outcomes cannot be discounted. When volcanoes release vast amounts of aerosols and sulfates into the air, they damage the ozone layer. Might the same be true for geoengineering? If polar ice returned, thanks to judicious management of solar radiation, water and weather cycles in the tropics might be altered if sulfates were released in just one hemisphere. And the ocean's chemistry would continue to change as concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere rise. If they ever happen at all, negotiations over large-scale geoengineering would be long and arduous. Climate change has at least brought the Arctic fresh attention from world leaders. Xi Jinping, China's president, stopped in nearby Anchorage on his recent return from America. Barack Obama became the first sitting American president to visit the Arctic. In May, a ministerial meeting of the Arctic Council, at which America will hand over the chairmanship to Finland for its two-year stint, 
offers an opportunity for Rex Tillerson, America's Secretary of State, to set the new administration's policy for the region. To ensure political and commercial stability in a defrosting Arctic, and to limit the harm caused by and to the warming pole, countries need to pay it far greater attention. The danger is that it is already too late. Briefing: Sea levels and storms, a thaw point. As the Arctic melts, the rest of the world suffers. Shrinking Arctic ice is sure to have unwelcome effects elsewhere on the planet. But what precisely? Glaciologists and meteorologists are working furiously to understand two particularly complex issues that may cause huge upheavals: the stability of the Greenland ice sheet and its potential contribution to rising sea levels. And extreme weather elsewhere in the world that might result from the demise of the Arctic's white wastes. Since the 1970s, the Arctic has been the main cause of rising sea levels around the world. Over two thirds of the Arctic's contribution derives from ice loss from Greenland, according to the latest Swiper report. But little is known about how Greenland's vast ice sheet will react to future warming. The dynamics of outlet glaciers and ice streams as they flow ever faster into the Arctic Ocean, how pressurized meltwater combines with soft sediments to lubricate the bed of Greenland's ice sheet, and the impact of increased darkening across the ice sheet surface are all poorly understood, says Alan Hubbard, a glaciologist at the University of Tromso. Greenland is a large sleeping giant. Being prodded by many different processes on all sides, he explains, getting to grips with what is going on will be tough. Field work on Greenland's remote ice sheet is expensive and logistically taxing, but what is known now is frightening enough. Even if current emissions remain stable, the consensus is that global sea levels will rise by 74 centimeters by the end of the century. Vast coastal cities such as Rotterdam, New York, and Mumbai will suffer. These may still be among the luckier ones. Governments are more likely to pay to protect expensive property than poor rural settlements. Some villages in Alaska need relocating already. Receding sea ice has exposed coastlines to erosion from waves, but federal, state, and local authorities. A squabbling over how to do it and who should pay, even on this small scale. Floods of icy meltwater will change the weather too. By altering the salinity and temperature of different parts of the sea, circulation patterns, both within the Arctic Ocean and consequently in the atmosphere, will change. That will affect weather and climate phenomena, such as India's monsoon season. Thousands of miles to the south, scientists agree as much. Where they differ is on just how large the effect will be and which processes are involved. Extreme cold snaps pose a particular puzzle in this regard. Changes to wind patterns can bring cooler weather farther south, which could help explain frigid conditions in northeastern America in recent winters. But these wind shifts have to be large enough to cancel out more general background warming stemming from the loss of sea ice, says James Screen of the University of Exeter. In northwest Europe, it seems that these two effects of melting sea ice roughly balance out, he says. But climatic imbalances from Arctic melting could prove far more harmful elsewhere in the world. United States. The Economist, April twenty ninth to May fifth, two thousand and seventeen, in the United States section. American diplomacy, a tradition traduced. Trump's first one hundred days promises, promises. Lexington on John Kasich's lament, and more. United States. American diplomacy, 
A tradition traduced. The State Department is far from perfect, but the administration's treatment of it is doing some real damage. Few Americans would have known it, but on New Year's Eve, their diplomats probably prevented scores of killings in Central Africa and perhaps a war. President Joseph Kabila, Congo's long-stay autocrat, had refused to leave power as he was obliged to do. Angry protesters were taking to the streets of Kinshasa, and Mr. Kabila's troops buckling up to see them there. Yet, through a combination of adroit negotiating and the high-minded pushiness that comes with representing a values-based superpower, Tom Periano, the State Department's then special envoy for the Great Lakes, and John Kerry, the then Secretary of State, helped persuade Mr. Kabila to back down. The resulting deal, brokered by the Catholic Church, committed Mr. Kabila to a power-sharing arrangement and retirement later this year. That would represent the first ever. Peaceful transition in Congo, but it probably won't happen. Three weeks later, Donald Trump became president, and the State Department's 100 odd political appointees, including Mr. Kerry and Mr. Periello, shipped out. That is normal in American transitions, but the most senior career diplomats were also pushed out, which is not, and only Mr. Kerry has so far been replaced. By Rex Tillerson, a well-regarded former boss of Exxon Mobil, he had no ambition to be Secretary of State or knew he was being interviewed for the job until Mr. Trump offered it to him. Now installed as the voice of American foreign policy, he has maintained, notwithstanding his undoubted qualities, an oil man's aversion to public scrutiny. He rarely speaks to journalists or visits American embassies on his trips abroad. He appears absorbed by the ticklish task of arranging a 31 percent cut in his department's budget, which Mr. Trump will shortly propose to Congress. The vacant positions, in effect, almost the State Department's entire decision-making staff of undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and ambassadors, are being covered by mid-ranking civil servants. Who lack the authority or understanding of the administration's plans to take the initiative? America's diplomatic operation is idling at best. A sense of demoralization, described in interviews with a dozen serving and former diplomats, permeates it. I went to a policy planning meeting the other day, and we spent half the time talking about someone's bad back. Says a diplomat. We've never been so bereft of leadership," says another. A third predicts a wave of resignations. To allies, the fallout from this neglect is less obvious. American diplomacy has become more passive than bungling. The American ambassador is still the most powerful foreign diplomat in just about any country," says a senior European politician. Still, there are costs to the administration's mismanagement of the State Department, including, for example, in Congo. After America went quiet on him, Mr. Kabila sabotaged the power-sharing agreement, renewing the prospect of violence. The scale of the assault Mr. Trump has launched on the State Department is unprecedented, yet consistent with a decades-old trend. The National Security Council, which has swollen from a staff of 20 in the late 1960s to over 400 under Barack Obama, has supplanted it as the primary instrument of foreign policy making. Spending on diplomacy has been slashed in relative terms. In 1950, when American diplomats were overseeing the reconstruction of Europe and a propaganda war against the Soviet Union, it was half that of the defense budget. Now, at less than one percent of the federal budget, it is only a tenth as large. This diminution is in part the result of large forces, including globalization and communications technology. Most federal agencies, including the Treasury and the Department of Homeland Security, now communicate with their foreign counterparts directly, not as they once did through diplomats. Foreign policy has become an all-government affair. Every department is doing diplomacy, and it's not clear that the State Department is the most influential," says Jeremy Shapiro, a former State Department adviser now at the European Council on Foreign Relations.
The result is a diplomatic cadre in reduced circumstances and exposed to political attack, yet which still performs, as Mr. Pariello's brief triumph in Congo illustrates, important feats that no other agency can. The department's Republican critics accuse it of behaving like a liberal think tank, won't to lobby for exciting foreign interests instead of pursuing America's. The biggest problem with American diplomats is clientitis. They go native, says a former ambassador. Yet that view, though indisputably valid at times, takes little account of the slow-moving and densely political nature of much of the department's work. There are few straightforward America First wins in diplomacy, and if more focused agencies such as the CIA and Defense Department, specialists in catching terrorists and dropping bombs, are easier to explain, they are also frequently prone to short-termism and error. It is doubtful that either could have prevailed with Mr. Kabila. It would not have occurred to them to try. Yet such diplomatic efforts also have security implications for America, as James Mattis, the Defense Secretary, once noted, while admonishing Congress, "If you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition." The objective should be to preserve the State Department's distinctive strengths while tailoring it to its altered circumstances. A report last year by the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, included useful recommendations on how this might be attempted. To avoid duplication, it suggested trimming the department's 68 special envoys and advisers. To obtain better value for money, it proposed a review of states' contributions to multilateral agencies, an exercise that led Britain to cut its support for four UN agencies. To counter some of the damaging effects of the internet, it recommended increasing public diplomacy, which the State Department could do with in America as well as abroad, to counter its poor standing compared with the country's lionized soldiers. To streamline top-level decision making, Heritage also suggested eliminating one of the department's two deputy posts: the Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources. Even diplomats who disagree with these suggestions consider them broadly reasonable. While speaking up for the value of the deputy secretary position, Heather Higginbottom, who until recently occupied it, conceded, "But these things happen, and it wouldn't be the biggest loss." Yet this sort of sensible institutional reform is not what the Trump administration appears to have in mind. It needs money to fund a promised $54 billion increase in defense spending, and sees the State Department budget as one of the few places it can get it. It appears scarcely to have considered the consequences of its intended raid. This is a hard power budget, not a soft power budget. Was the most Mick Mulvaney, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, had to offer. That is precisely the knuckle-headed trade-off Mr. Mattis advised against. A point since reiterated by over 120 retired generals and admirals who have urged the administration to rethink. Mr. Tillerson, who seems hardly to have resisted the proposed cut, has also said little about how he would implement it. His advisers are said to be using the heritage recommendations as a guide, however, which suggests a lot of top-level job cuts are in the offing. There is also an expectation that unfavored departments dealing with climate change policy and perhaps human rights will be axed or amalgamated. A related plan leaked to foreign policy envisages cutting aid to developing countries by a third. It would also shrink America's overseas aid agency, U.S. Aid, and roll it into the State Department. Congress is unlikely to approve such drastic measures. Lindsey Graham, a Republican senator prominent in foreign affairs, describes Mr. Trump's budget proposals as dead on arrival. Even so, says a well-placed Republican aide, there is an expectation on Capitol Hill that aid and diplomatic spending will take a cut. Meanwhile, the running down of America's diplomacy, a great tradition which brought France into the War of Independence and helped build the international system after the Second World War, continues.
One of the Trump administration's better ideas was to reduce the power of the NSC in order to bolster the interagency policy-making process and thereby the agencies themselves. In the case of the Defense Department, whose vastness and military spine make it less vulnerable to traumatic transitions, this seems to be happening. Mr. Mattis is getting high marks for pushing decision-making down to lower levels. But the State Department, having hardly anyone in place to represent it forcefully in the interagency process, and little clarity on what the government's foreign policy is, is ceding even more power to the NSC. It is an astonishingly careless way to treat an institution that, whatever its weaknesses, America needs.